Plato erupts into the history of human thought around the turn of the 4th century BCE and has fundamentally informed the entire philosophical tradition ever since. He wasn't exactly the first philosopher, but his self-consciousness about what philosophy consists of and what philosophers do mean that, means that he's inevitably regarded as the inventor or founder of what we mean by philosophy. Together with his brilliant student Aristotle, he laid the groundwork for the contents and methods of intellectual inquiry into the three great questions that underpinned the main branches of ancient philosophy. These are, how should we live? That's ethics and politics. What is being and what lies beyond human experience? That's ontology and metaphysics. And how can we be sure of what we know? That's epistemology. Plato's central conception of the world is that the one that we perceive with our senses is faulty and changeable. But there is another perfect realm where eternal, unchanging entities called forms or ideas reside. And they somehow constitute models or abstractions of the constituents of the world that we can see, hear, touch and smell. Some of the most important of these forms are those of goodness, or justice, beauty, equality, and change. The philosopher, whose task it is to understand and know the forms of things, must distinguish between the many perceptible objects that appear beautiful or good or equal, and the one entity or form or abstract idea that is what beauty itself is, or virtue is, or largeness, size, actually and essentially are. Now, almost all of Plato's uh, works address this distinction or are completely dependent upon it. Some inquire into the moral and practical consequences of his double conception of reality. We need to regard the soul, which can grasp the nature of the forms, as capable of existence independently of our bodies. In a few passages, for example, in Ismino, it's said that the soul recollects what it once understood of the forms, when it was disembodied before the birth of its possessor. When um, uh, in our embodied lives, therefore, we are somehow rewarded or punished for choices made in previous lives. But the most important consequence of the theory of the forms is that true philosophers who spend their lives <laughs> contemplating the forms are able to become morally superior to the unenlightened rest of humanity. Now, while some of this can sound mystical, the theory of the forms is, if nothing else, a very brave attempt to answer the conundrum which we now explain by the idea that the human brain is somehow hardwired by genetics to be able to operate cognitively in certain ways. For example, in terms of a basic grasp of geometrical concepts or Noam Chomsky's theory of universal grammar. That is, Plato is the first thinker to have attempted a comprehensive and analytical answer to what philosophers call the problem of universals. Discrete phenomena share identifiable properties, blueness or shortness or beauty, but do those properties have an existence apart from the phenomena in which they're manifested? And if so, what sort of an existence is it? And how do we humans identify and talk about these abstract properties? Plato as writer. Even if we can't accept the theory of forms, we do need to acknowledge that Plato was an experimental, thrilling and graceful prose writer whose works set the bar on the elegance and vividness of philosophical distance so high that few have ever rivaled him. The dialogue form he uses brings to colourful, delicately characterised and often ironically witty life several important figures in the political and intellectual life of late 5th century Athens. These include the great sophists Protagoras, Hippias and Gorgias. Several dialogues uh, contain extended purple passages of narrative or storytelling which have exerted incalculable influence 
on passages of literature rather than philosophy. One is Protagoras' version of the Prometheus myth. Prometheus' brother Epimetheus has made the creatures that walk on the earth. Prometheus comes along to inspect the distribution and he finds that the other animals were suitably furnished, but the man alone was naked and shoeless and didn't have beds nor arms to defend himself with. And the appointed hour was approaching when man in his turn was to go forth into the light of day. Prometheus stole the mechanical arts of Hephaestus and Athene and fire with them and gave them to humankind. So man had the wisdom necessary to support life. But he still hadn't got political wisdom. That was in the keeping of Zeus. Prometheus entered by stealth into the common workshop of Athene and Hephaestus, carried off their arts and fire, and in this way man was supplied with the means of life. Another platonic purple passage that's recently become a sort of manifesto for gay rights is the beautiful speech of the comic dramatist Aristophanes in Plato's Symposium. This dialogue consists of, uh, well, it describes a drinking party held to celebrate the victory in a drama competition of a tragedian named Agathon. And it features a stellar guest list, including the young statesman Alcibiades, the famous doctor, Eric Symmachus and Socrates, as well as Aristophanes. The entertainment at the party consists of the diners making speech about love or eros. Socrates' narrative tells how, as a young man, he was taught the true nature of love by a wise woman called Diotima. She taught Socrates that eros drives people to seek beauty. First, beautiful bodies. And then, as the lover grows in wisdom, beautiful souls. This is part and parcel of the love of wisdom, or philosophy. The lover progresses up a ladder from recognizing the beauty of his beloved to understanding beauty as an ideal concept, which leads to thinking about divinity, the source of that beauty, to love of divinity itself. So by thinking about the essence of beauty, the philosopher can give birth to fine thoughts and speeches. That myutic metaphor of the philosopher as the midwife to ideas is absolutely central to Diotima's argument. But Aristophanes' speech is charming and funny and humane, if it's less elevated and mystical. He says that originally there were three sexes, men, women, and an androgynous combination. These three types of prototypical human were all spherical. They had four hands and four feet, one head with two faces looking opposite ways, and moved by somersaulting their bodies along. But they got above their station and they dared to challenge the gods. Zeus punished them by cutting them in two, like an apple, says Plato, which is halved for pickling, or as you might divide an egg in half with a hair. These humans physically split from their literal other halves, grew very melancholy. So Zeus took pity and redesigned them so that they could embrace frontally. Now, man and woman, or man and man, or woman and woman, can be satisfied and rest and go their ways to the business of life. So ancient is the desire of one another which is implanted in us reuniting our original nature, making one of two and healing the state of humankind. Each of us, when separated, having one side only, like a flat fish, is always looking for his other half. And when one of them meets his or her other half, the actual half of himself, the pair are lost in an amazement of love and friendship and intimacy and would not be out of the other's sight even for a moment. These people passed their whole lives together, yet they couldn't explain what they desire of one another. The intense yearning does not appear to be the desire of lovers' intercourse, but of something else which the soul of either evidently desires, but cannot tell. There's humour aplenty in Plato, such as the sending up of the tactics of the sophist charlatan brothers Euthydemus 
and Dionysodorus in the Euthydemus. In Laches, there's a hilarious description of an embarrassing incident when Stesilaus, who's this celebrated exponent of uh, fighting in armour, got his spear stuck in the rigging of a ship. There are caricatures of crazed performers of poetry, such as the star rhapsode in Ion and the lovesick Hippothales and Lysis. The funniest passage of all, for me, occurs in the most tragic of the dialogues, the Phaedo. The topic under discussion is memory and recollection. But one of Socrates' disciples keeps saying that he's forgotten what stage they've got to in the argument and needs to be reminded. Plato also thought up some of the most beautiful images and descriptions in our cultural canon, such as the setting of the Phaedrus, a gorgeous dialogue on the immortality of the soul. Unusually, it takes place in the countryside. Socrates describes the setting. Here, a fair resting place full of summer sounds and scents. Here is the lofty spreading plane tree, the withy high and clustering in the fullest blossom and the greatest fragrance. The stream which flows beneath the plane tree is deliciously cold to the feet. And judging from the ornaments and images, this must be a spot sacred to the river Achelaus and the nymphs. How delightful is the breeze. So very sweet. And there's a sound in the air, shrill and summer-like, which makes answer to the chorus of the cicadas. But the greatest charm of all is this grass, like pillow gently sloping to the head. Later, Socrates tells Phaedrus the myths of the cicadas that they can hear. They will report their conversations to the muses of philosophy. The cicadas are the messengers for the muses. The cicadas are said to have been human beings in an age before the muses. And when the muses came, and song appeared, they were ravished with delight, singing always, never thought of eating or drinking, until at last in their forgetfulness they died. And now they live on again as grasshoppers, cicadas. This is the reason which the muses made to them. And they're neither hunger nor thirst, but from the hour of their birth are always singing. When they die, they go and tell the muses in heaven as to who honours them on earth. They win the love of Terpsichore for the dancers, of Irato for the lovers, and they win the love for the philosophers of Calliope, the eldest muse, and of Urania, who is next to her. For these two muses are those chiefly concerned with heaven and thought, divine as well as human, and they have the sweetest utterance. For many reasons, then, says Socrates, we ought always to talk and not to sleep at midday. And both the cicada theme and uh, the lunchtime uh, lecture format are therefore entirely in the tradition of both Plato and Thomas Gresham with his grasshopper. Now, in this lecture, after a look at the biographical evidence and Plato's relationship to earlier thinkers, especially his teacher Socrates, we analyse his masterpiece, The Republic. Their conclusion will then consist of a few words about his Atlantis narratives and influence on the subsequent history of thought. So what about Plato's life and works? Plato was born in the Athenian deme of Kolytos into a rich and distinguished family. His mother included amongst her ancestors the great Athenian lawgiver Solon. His father, Ariston's family, was said to be descended from Codrus, one of the earliest mythical kings of Athens. And through Codrus, from the sea god Poseidon himself. Plato had a sister and two brothers, Glaucus and Adimantus, who both appear in the Republic. His real name wasn't Plato, it was Aristocles, but he was universally known as Plato. This means broad, and some ancient authorities said that he was a boxer or wrestler, and it referred to his broad chest. Others said that he had a wide forehead or that it referred to his capacious style of writing and wide range of interests. His father died when he was little, his mother remarried, and he also had a younger half-brother called Antiphon, who appears in his Parmenides. 
Plato was born around the time of the death of Pericles and was in his mid-twenties when at the end of the Peloponnesian War the beautiful regime of the 30 tyrants was installed. One of the men they killed was Polymarchus at his house in Piraeus, the Republic is set. And two of the 30 tyrants were Plato's uncles, Critias and Charmides. Plato was either not disgusted by what they did and or carefully portrayed them in Charmides and Protagoras in their youths long before they were corrupted by politics. Charmides also appears in Symposium. These authoritarian politicians were both killed in battle by the pro-democracy forces that ousted them. And Plato really dislikes democracy, but in Republic, he's even more critical of tyranny. So the question of what he really thought about his dodgy uncles must remain open. After the death of his inspirational teacher Socrates in 399 BCE, Plato probably traveled for a decade perhaps studying mathematics with the Pythagoreans in Sicily. He probably began writing soon after the death of Socrates, starting with the Apology and going on to Protagoras, Euthyphro and Ion. He founded the Academy at Athens in around 385, made at least one visit to Sicily, where a friend named Dion wanted him to supervise the education of his nephew, Dionysius II. But Plato returned to Athens and continued work at the academy until his death in his early 80s. He was fortunate to be born into the Athenian intellectual culture, where some of the greatest of the very early philosophers, the sophists, Protagoras, Prodicus, Hippias, Gorgias, had been or were about to start teaching. Aristotle says that Plato as a youth was familiar with the doctrines of the pre-Socratics as well, Cratylus and Heraclitus, and his debts to the Pythagoreans have been very well demonstrated. But it was Socrates who had by far the greatest influence on the development of Plato's thought. Because Socrates left no writings of his own, whilst featuring as the star of most of Plato's dialogues, we're left with a problem in distinguishing the thought and methods of the two men. We know there were certain differences. For example, Socrates was interested in national, natural science, which Plato wasn't interested in. And Socrates, although he did fall foul of the democracy in a way that precipitated his death, seems in his prime to have been a loyal Democrat who fought very bravely under the command of the radical Democrat Cleon. Plato, on the other hand, had no time for the Athenian democracy at all. But the main principles of Platonic philosophy, especially the concept of the realm of the ideal or abstract forms, the distrust of rhetoric, the quest for truth, and the elenchic question and answer method, all of those seem to have been Socrates' central principles too. I think Plato may have embarked on his dialogues as a direct response to the execution of Socrates, tried for impiety and corrupting the minds of the youth of Athens in 399 BCE. His apology actually contains Socrates' own self-defense speech. His Crito sees him condemned in prison and refusing his disciple Crito's offer of money to secure his departure from Athens. He was actually offered a choice of exile or hemlock. And his Phaedo reports his discussions with his disciples in the hours leading up to the administration of the hemlock. Plato, however, was not present he tells us he was unwell. Now, there's no doubt, though, that Plato mightily admired and loved this teacher. That death must have affected him deeply. 25 dialogues that have survived that are believed to be by Plato himself. They're usually placed into three chronological periods, early, middle, and late, on various grounds, including stylometry. They're all written in the 4th century BCE, but portray discussions that had ceased with the death of Socrates in 399. They cover a huge range of topics. What is beauty in the Hippias Major? What, if any, is the best kind of falsehood in the Hippias Minor? What is courage in the Lackeys, friendship in the Lysis? What sort of knowledge do poets have of their subject matter in their poems, like warfare, 
in the ion. In Cratylus, Plato asks what the relationship is of words to things, names to people. Are they arbitrary social constructions or do they reveal something about the true nature of what their label's for? He explores what's wrong with sophistic arguments in the Euthydemus, what's the difference between sense perceptions and true knowledge in the Theotetus, and what is the nature of true pleasure in the Philebus. But the underlying Socratic, Platonic, philosophical positioning centering on the immaterial world of the forms is common to all of them. The one that seems to me of most immediate relevance today, besides the Republic, um, is the Gorgias. In this one, Socrates debates with one of the greatest teachers of rhetoric, the Sicilian Gorgias, exploring what rhetoric is and whether, crucially, it can be used for good purposes. Socrates thinks that in practice, rhetoric is not actually a craft or a science, but merely a knack of flattering audiences. The skilled peak speaker, he says, knows how to make his audience feel good just by identifying with the speaker. So rhetoric's problematic when it's taught and used by spin doctors who've not studied moral philosophy and don't know what is good. Socrates distinguishes between mere opinion and truth, alternative facts. He gets Gorgias to agree that a skilled speaker is more effective when his audience is ignorant because control of the tools of persuasion makes him appear to have conviction, regardless of facts. He compares rhetoric to baking pastries with fancy crusts or using cos cosmetics, surface ornamentation, only imitating or faking what is actually a good pie or a good physique. The dialogue ranges over other matters, including whether morality itself is an absolute or something that depends on your relative and culturally learned point of view. And Gorgias ends with Socrates relating what his interlocutors think is a myth, but he actually says is true. This is called the story of the judgment of naked souls. In the old days, Kronos used to judge men just before they died, when they still had their clothes on, deciding whether each one deserved to go to, after death to the Isles of the Blessed or to Tartarus. But those judges were fooled by appearances. Zeus innovated when he became top god. He stripped bodies after death, but before judgment. He stripped the naked, implying that to know a person truly, you have to divest them of all outward trappings and concentrate on the soul. So, let's go for it. The Republic. Set during the Peloponnesian War, the Republic develops most of Plato's core ideas in a very long conversation that would have taken many hours in reality. And I here break it down into summary, a summary of each of the ten books, but I focus on the chief images and analogies he uses to help explain his ideas, as well as those principal arguments. But one, Socrates and Plato's older brother Glaucon visit the Piraeus, the harbour city, to attend a festival of the recently introduced Thracian goddess Bendis. At the house of the wealthy resident alien and philosopher Polymarchus, who Plato's audience knew had died at the hands of the tyrants subsequently, Socrates speaks to Poly Polymarchus' father Cephalus. He argues that justice cannot be defined as being truthful and returning what one owes. Polymarchus thinks that justice, a very conventional Greek view, is helping your friends and harming your enemies. But Socrates disagrees. Why? Because it's difficult to know who our real friends are. So it's safer just to be just to everyone. Socrates also tackles the bullish sophist Thrasymachus' definition of justice as simply the advantage of the stronger party, force majeure or might is right. Thrasymachus insists that the unjust person, provided he's undetected, will be happier than the just person like a tyrant who can do anything he wants. Socrates disagrees. 
but says they really can't decide whether the just life is happier or better than the unjust life until they define justice itself. Book two. Attempts are made to divide good things into components, those that are good in themselves, those good in their consequences, and those good in both. Plato's brother Glaucon has not been persuaded by the arguments in the previous discussion. A problem is identified that one might be happier if unjust, but with a reputation for justice, and vice versa. Glaucon, Plato's brother, asks whether any man can be so virtuous that he would resist the temptation of behaving unjustly if he could do so without having to fear detection. And he cites the myth of Gyges' ring of invisibility. Gyges was a shepherd who discovered a magic ring of invisibility inside a bronze horse revealed by an earthquake. By means of this ring's power, he murdered the king and won the affection of the queen. Glaucon says, suppose now there were two such magic rings and the just put on one of them and then the unjust the other, no man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand vast injustice. No man would keep his hands off what was not his own when he could safely take what he liked out of the market or go into houses and sleep with anyone at pleasure or kill or release from prison whom he would and at all respects be like a god amongst men. All men believe in their hearts that injustice is much more profitable to the individual than justice. Socrates proposes that a way out of this philosophical quagmire of justice and its relationship to happiness would be this, to identify justice in the city first and then, and only then, proceed by analogy to the individual. So this double project, trying to find what individual virtue might be by identifying and defining the most potentially virtuous community is at the core of the remainder of the Republic. And it's not without its problems. We're never told what the relationship consists in, nor how the analogy can be justified. Nevertheless, Socrates begins by saying we enter life in the city community together because we are not, as individuals, self-sufficient. Each of one of us has certain natural abilities and the only efficient way to run the city is for each individual to stick doggedly to a single job that she or he is suited for. The city will also need an army to defend it and carefully educated guardians. Poetry and stories need to be censored and only ever present the gods as good, unchanging and averse to deception. And in book three, Socrates continues to discuss the censorship of the arts in the Republic with Glaucon. Only good examples of behaviour and character are to be allowed. There can be no theatre or theatrical imitation because it affects character, whether you're acting or spectating. The guardians should also receive good physical training. They should, however, be prepared to tell citizens a myth, indeed a lie the noble lie, to ensure that everyone accepts that fixed position in society. And to illustrate this, Socrates comes up with the myth of metals. This explains how rulers contain gold, guardians contain silver, and everyone else, farmers and craftsmen, bronze. The guardian class will share communal property, get what they need from taxes paid by the other classes, and eat in common messes. Movement or mating between the different metal classes must be nearly impossible. And this use of a myth, Socrates explains, in a way that sounds rather sinister to us, is as a contrivance for one of those falsehoods that come into being in case of need, some noble one. In book four, Plato's other brother, Adimantus, says that the guardians won't be happy. Socrates says that the aim is to make the whole city happy. So there must be neither extreme wealth nor poverty, and the city shouldn't be too big. The guardians should share wives and children, rarely innovate, and they should follow traditional religion. Such a city will be wise, courageous, moderate, and just. 
Justice consists in each class performing its proper function. Now, the next step is to identify those four virtues of wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice in the individual. He argues that the soul has three parts, rational, spirited, and appetitive or desirous. And these parts of the soul must be balanced, and that is justice in the individual, like each class performing its own function in the city. In book five, Socrates wants to compare unjust because imbalanced political regimes and the corresponding unjust individuals. But Adimantus and Polymarchus have been rattled by that reference to shared women and children. So Socrates at this point can't get on with what he wants to, which is defining justice. He suggests rather outrageously to ancient Greek men that guardian women have the same job as guardian men. The best guardian men are to have sex with the best guardian women and make the best possible guardian babies. The best uh, marriages will be determined by lot, but the best guardian men can sleep with as many women as they like. Children are to be reared far away from their parents. The parents won't know who their own biological children are. Socrates also gives instructions on how these best people will be trained for war. And then he gets back to justice. The rulers must be philosophers. Philosophers are the only ones who can identify unified principles or abstract forms behind multiplicities of appearances and truly know them rather than just have opinions about them. In book six, Socrates continues that philosophers should be the rulers regardless of their being wholly unelected because they hate falsehood, are courageous, moderate, quick learners, Good, have good memories and are pleasant people. Adimantus objects at this point that real life philosophers he knows are either useless or bad people. And here Socrates responds with the analogy of the ship of state. Allegations of uselessness aimed at philosophers are false. He compares the general population to, strong but, to a strong but short-sighted shipping owner, we are in the Piraeus, ignorant of maritime affairs. The constantly quarrelsome sailors are the demagogues and politicians. The navigator is the philosopher. The sailors imagine they can captain the ship and each one tries to get the ship owner to give him the command. They even chain up the navigator, drug him and deride him as a useless stargazer, even though he's the only one who can steer the ship aright. So-called philosophers Philosophers can be bad because they're corrupted by a bad education, as the sophists were. But true philosophers would avoid corruption by leading a quiet life. Philosophers must do nothing but philosophy. But this ideal city can only come into being if it's to be begun again entirely anew. Philosophers must study the form of the good. And we're at the real kernel of the Republic now. Socrates attempts to explain what the form of the good is through, firstly, the analogy of the sun. As the sun illuminates the objects so the eye can see them, so the form of the good renders the objects of knowledge knowable to the human soul. As the sun provides things with their ability to uh, grow and be and be nourished, the form of the good provides the objects of knowledge with their being, even though itself is higher than being. Next, Socrates offers the second analogy, the divided line. He divides the line into two sections, each subdivided, and the lower two parts represent the visible realm, the top two parts, the superior, only mentally intelligible realm. In the first section, Socrates places images and shadows, in the second, visible objects. In the third, truths arrived at via hypotheses, as mathematicians do, and only in the last, the forms themselves. And corresponding to each of these four things, there's a capacity of the human soul, imagination, belief, thought, and understanding. 
In book seven, then Socrates illustrates how the philosophers will learn this true understanding with the analogy of the cave. Socrates asks Glaucon to imagine a group of men living in an underground cave approached by a long passageway leading to the sunshine. The men have been chained there from infancy with their necks bound so they can only see in front of them. A fire burns, a fire burns behind and above them and between the men and the fire, a wall resembling a screen is set up, um, resembling the screen that's set up by puppet masters. Other people carry objects which show above the wall, statues and model animals. The prisoners naturally infer that the shadows of these objects cast upon the back wall of the cave, which they must face, are the only realities. But Socrates argues that if one of them were set free and led towards the fire and then towards the sunlight, he would eventually accept the sun is the real cause of everything in the visible world and the shadows in the cave were not real at all. The philosopher kings of the Republic, who would be thus enlightened, will at first study poetry, music and PE, like the other guardians, then maths, geometry, astronomy, harmonics, dialectic, which will allow them to understand the forms and the form of the good. Then they're to undergo no fewer than 15 years of practical political education. Since we need to make this city, this ideal city from scratch, Socrates rather outrageously says the best thing would be to expel everyone over the age of 10 from an existing city. In book eight, Glaucon remembers that Socrates was about to describe the four types of unjust regime along with their corresponding unjust individuals. Socrates says that people must stay in their classes or there will be class conflict. There needs to be aristocracy or rule by the best, meaning not the hereditary nobility, but the best qualified and tra trained, that is the philosopher guardians. The soul has three parts, rationality, spiritedness, and desire or repetitiveness, but rationality must be in charge. This corresponds, um, the foot, sorry, must be in charge. Reason has got to be the charioteer in, in the Phaedrus that drives the chariot of the soul. Now, the first of the deviant regimes, other than this aristocracy of the philosopher kings, is timocracy, which emphasizes pursuit of time, honor, and success rather than wisdom or justice. And that corresponds with there being too much spiritedness in an individual. The next regime, which is deviant, is oligarchy, which pursues money. And the oligarchic individual has too much of the desiring, appetitive part of the soul as well as spiritedness. The third deviant regime is democracy, which arises because desire dominates. The democratic individual has neither shame nor self-discipline. And the fourth deviant regime is tyranny. Tyranny, tyrants take democratic freedom and desires to an extreme. So we're getting towards the argument's climax now in book nine. The tyrannical individual is mad with appetites and lust and will do anything to slake them. He's enslaved to his passions and therefore miserable, fearful, incapable of trust and friendship. Socrates concludes from this, crucially, that the just are happier than the unjust. He off offers another proof of this by analyzing pleasure. Most pleasure is not true, but only a relief from pain. The only truly fulfilling pleasure is that which comes from understanding, since the objects it pursues are permanent. Socrates adds that it's only if the rational part of the soul uh, is, uh, the rational part rules the soul, that each part of the soul can find its proper pleasure. And he then calculates how many times the best life is more pleasant than the worst. And it's exactly 729 times. Um, this number is probably not arbitrary. 729 is 27 squared, and its center is 365, the days in a year. 
It was an important figure in Pythagorean studies and, interestingly, in early Chinese wisdom literature. But Socrates concludes by discussing an imaginary Socrates concludes by discussing an imaginary hybrid beast to illustrate the consequences of justice and injustice in the soul. The just man who controls his inner lion and his many-headed hydra, so all or the, the spirited parts and the uh, appetitive parts, will be 729 times happier than the man who lets them rampage. In Book 10, Socrates claims that his early rejection of imitative poetry, that's theatre and epic poetry, from the just city is now vindicated. And he distinguishes several levels of imitation through the example of a bed. There is the form of the bed, which is good. There's a picture of a bed, which is false. And there's just a a bed, not a photograph as here, but literally imagine a bed. And in fact, that's false too. Only the form of bedness is true. Poets and painters, he says, produce imitations without knowledge of the true nature of bedness. He uses a comparison with optical illusions to argue that imitated poetry caused the parts of the soul to be at war with each other, and it leads to injustice. The just city should not allow poetry in it, but only poetry that praises the gods and good humans. Imitated poetry prevents the immortal soul from gaining its greatest reward. We know the soul is immortal because the things are destroyed are destroyed by their own evil, as the body is destroyed by its own evil, which is disease. The soul's evils are ignorance, injustice and other vices, but they don't destroy the soul. So the soul, he says, must be immortal. We just can't understand it if we only discuss it in relation to the body. And finally, at the end of the Republic, Socrates describes the rewards of justice to Glaucon. The gods love the just and hate the unjust. Good things come to those whom the gods love. Socrates lists various rewards for the just and punishments for the unjust in this life. But he then tells the myth of Ur to illustrate reward and punishment in the after the life. Ur uh, died uh, in battle, but, and went, but he didn't die, but he, he was allowed to see what went on um, in, in, in the afterlife and then came back to report it. The souls of the dead are able to choose their next lives and then they are reincarnated. Socrates ends the discussion by prompting Glaucon and the others to do well both in this life and in the afterlife. The Atlantis stories. No general account of Plato could be complete without mentioning one of his ideas that has exerted a huge influence but actually more on visual art, fiction, and cinema than on philosophy. And that is the story of the lost land of Atlantis, which Plato seems to have invented entirely. This is told in Plato's Timaeus and Critias in some of Plato's most exquisite prose. A priest addressing the wise Athenian Solon speaks to him of a mighty sea power based in a visually dazzling kingdom sacred to Poseidon, which, unprovoked, made an expedition against the whole of Europe and Asia. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable. There was an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together. And in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others and over parts of the continent. And furthermore, the men of Atlantis had objected the parts of Libya within the colon, columns of Hercules as far as Egypt and Europe as far as Tyrrhenia, which is, is, is uh, basically uh, Croatia. 
This vast sea power of Atlantis attacked the Greeks, but they fought her off, led by the brave Athenians. But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods. The island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared into the depths of the sea. Now, although Plato probably dreamed up Atlantis as an entirely fictional metaphor for the Athenian democratic naval empire, which he would have liked to be superseded by a non-naval city-state ruled by philosophers rather than working-class oarsmen. Nevertheless, marine archaeologists want it to be true, and their search for this lost submarine kingdom has never ended. Um, the Dogger Bank has been one of the projected uh, uh, Atlantises. Atlantis has also featured in movies ever since the silent era. It's familiar to any child with access to the Disney Channel. And through, uh, interestingly, Gollum's Ring of Invisibility in Lord of the Rings, they're also accessing Plato's Republic through Plato's great admirer, J.R.R. Tolkien. Plato's afterlife. When Plato died, the academicians selected Spusispus, his nephew, to lead the school rather than the brilliant Aristotle. And the academy continued to exert an enormous influence over the remainder of classical antiquity. It continued an operation for centuries, although another centre for activities uh, evolved at Alexandria. Uh, it's very uh, beautifully portrayed, the life of the Academy, in this mosaic from, Pope, from Pompeii. It did enter the cause of paganism against Christianity with the Neoplatonism of Ammonius and Plotinus, but actually most early Christian philosophers and St. Augustine, importantly, were Platonists too. And they found Plato's ideas of a higher realm of abstractions the immortality of the soul and the primacy of virtue uh, very compatible with Christianity. And that Neoplatonism was revived in the Italian Renaissance and exerted sustained interest thereafter. Jonathan Swift was an admirer of Plato. He owned two editions of his works and chose the head of Socrates as the image on his personal seal. The Republic is central to Swift's political philosophy and use of allegory. And although Socratic ideas permeate Swift's work, especially when he's puncturing pompous Christian dogma, it's in Book 4, 8 of Gulliver's Travels, 1726, that the influence of Platonic epistemology is best revealed. It's difficult for the Hunnian master, a commonsensical equine spokesman of Socratic belief in the distinction between true knowledge and opinion, it's difficult for him to comprehend the meaning of the word opinion or how a point could even be disputable because reason, he says, has taught us to affirm or deny only when we're certain and beyond our knowledge we never do either. There are no alternative facts. And nearly two centuries later, an Irish admirer of Plato and Swift called Robert Noonan, wrote a satire dissecting the false opinions about reality which allowed the oppressive British class system to perpetuate itself. The central trope of the famous novel, The Ragged Trousers Philanthropists, published posthumously in 1914 under the pseudonym Robert Tressel, is the platonic allegory of the cave. The novel narrates a dark, cold winter in the lives of Edwardian workmen renovating a mansion near Hastings known as The Cave and their oppression by capitalist overlords. It analyzes their sedation by alcohol and their unthinking reproduction of false ideas, the ideas required to perpetuate their oppression. Just one worker, a painter decorator named Frank Owen, has studied socialism and seen the light the truth about the economic system. Tressel uses the platonic allegory of the cave to explore what Marx is called the notion of false consciousness. He exposes how people living under an oppressive class system accept the ideology used to maintain it, 
which is in reality as false as the shadows the platonic prisoners think are existence objects in the cave. But Karl Popper would have taken issue with this positive socialist use of platonic epistemology in Trussell's novel. In his rightly famous book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, The Spell of Plato, 1945, Popper linked Plato's Republic to the worst aspects of fascist and communist one-party states. He wrote, the utopian attempt to realize an ideal state using a blueprint of society as a whole is one which demands a strong centralized rule of a few, which is therefore likely to lead to dictatorship. For Plato, it's nothing if not controversial. Nietzsche loathed him, writing in the twilight of the idols, 1889, for heaven's sake, do not throw Plato at me. I am a complete skeptic about Plato. Plato is boring. In the end, my mistrust of Plato goes deep. He represents such an aberration from all the basic instincts of the Hellene. He's so moralistic, so pre-existently Christian. One more recent writer who wrestled with Plato's ideas rather more positively all her life was Iris Murdoch. In The Fire and the Sun, 1977, she argued against Plato's denunciation of the arts in the Republic. But in her novels, especially The Black Prince, 1973, she shows a consistent fascination with platonic ethics and models of virtue. I have sympathies with all these views. I am myself more inclined towards Aristotle's appreciation and analysis a perceptible reality, a philosophical attitude which we'll be examining in the next lecture in this series. I'm more uh, inclined towards that than to platonic idealism. I appreciate the cynic Diogenes statement that although he can see the cups on the table, he can't see platonic cupness. I'm often exasperated by the manner in which the arguments of the dialogues proceed. I find myself as stumped as Socrates' interlocutors when he announces the ideal republic would require getting rid of everyone over the age of 10, while virtually banning any movement between classes and ancestral occupations. He adduces no arguments to show why justice in the state can illuminate it in an individual, nor does he prove the immortality of the soul. I'm annoyed when he uses a blatant fiction despite banning poetry and art himself from the Republic, or when he's rude about the oarsmen of Athens, who by being the majority of its citizens under the historical democracy were the executive power in the first great democratic constitution in history. Yet, I suspect Plato wants to elicit those reactions in order to make me work so that I can properly systematically, analytically, and philosophically justify holding a different position. Part of his genius lies in this spiky, interrogatory relationship with his reader. Plato trains you in argumentation regardless of whether you agree with Socrates' views. So ultimately, I can't help agreeing with this famous conclusion drawn by the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead in 1929 in his book, Process and Reality. The safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. I do not mean the systematic scheme of thought which solid which scholars have doubtfully extracted from his writings. I allude to the wealth of general ideas scattered through them. His personal endowments, his wide opportunities for experience at a great period of civilization, his inheritance of an intellectual tradition not yet stiffened by excessive systemization, these have made his writing an inexhaustible mine of suggestion. Thank you.